Good morning. Welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton, and my guest today is Ann Pugh. Hi, Ann. How are you? I'm very good. Great to see you, and I'm really honored. Um, as I said to you, a little scared, but I'm honored to be um, in this conversation with you. Well, for somebody who has spent, you know, almost half their life in the state house, there's nothing who has championed so many things. There's no reason for you to be scared at all because... You're an extraordinary human being. So let's let's tell my viewers a little bit about you. Ann Pugh is an American politician who served in the Vermont House of Representatives since 1993, and she recently resigned her seat in 2023. Representative Pugh, as the lead sponsor on Act 47, a 2019 law that codified the right to abortion in the state, she led that and sponsored that act. She began her career as a social worker and professor of social work at the University of Vermont for 26 years. She just retired in 2022. Anne was the chair of the House Committee on Human Services in the legislature for most of her career. She's a champion for the rights of humans to live in freedom and has transformed our state of Vermont these past 30 years to be one of tolerance, truth, kindness, and inclusiveness. Anne was selected as a tall fellow a Council of State Governments program that is recognized nationally for its leadership development programs for state government officials. Would you say that's that's about it? Um, uh, probably. I do want to correct, while well, you use the term professor, in the world of academia, that means that you have a PhD and you're on that track. I was actually a senior lecturer. Oh, well, poo-poo on that. I think you're... That well, whatever you were a senior lecturer, which you, which you are, you still senior lecturing. I am. Well, okay, I'm, senior lecturer, I'm senior lecturer emeriti because I um, basically retired. Although I'm still have 14 uh, graduate students who are doing social work internships, who um, I am their connection to the university, and I see them, and it keeps my fingers in social work. And so you're their mentor, and that's beautiful. Good for you. So I want to thank you for being on my show. I wanted to talk to you for a long, long time, and we got together at lunch and just had such a lovely time. And so I really thank you for this. And I wanted to interview you for a variety of, re variety of reasons as a leader of women's rights in the state. Um, and, and for 30 years, you've served our state. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Talk to us about growing up in Rye, New York, in your childhood. Um, I grew up in Rye, New York. Uh, my parents were older. Um, I was a surprise. Uh, um, or actually, my, my sister, um, who was seven years older, was um, perhaps the oh my heavens surprise because there was 12 years between she and her older sister and then four years between my brother. So um, my brother was through college and I think in law school when I was born. Um, I was two and a half um, when he was um, married. So I walked down the aisle with him. Uh, so it was um, on some level, while I had three siblings for most of, you know, most of my growing up, I grew up as an only child. Um, um, Ryan, New York is a upper middle class, upper middle class community outside of um, New York City. Um, so I have to say that I, I grew up um, with lots of opportunity um, that didn't stop me, I think, from my um, roots of social work, um, working in um, as, a, as a, what we called then a chambermaid and working at a gas station and at, um, for some of my jobs before I went to college at Union College in Schenectady, New York, where I was part of the charter class of women. Um, so there were a hundred and probably five of us. But as we connect, I mean, I, you and I are of an era where um, when I was in high school, if um, if young women found themselves pregnant, they left school. Um, and uh, they either had their child and kept it, had their child and gave it up for, um, gave the child up for adoption, or 
had um, an, an abortion, um, perhaps um, um, before it was legal, but we didn't legally. talk about it. They had, they had the abortion illegally and it was very dangerous. Yeah. And by the way, the boys never were 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 brought into the equation. No. They stayed in no. school. My best but, friend to leave school. Yeah, I remember that. But, you know, I mean, so, um, but that was sort of not, actually, interestingly, not a major part of my um, life. And I, I mean, I went to basically an all-male school, went to social work school out in um, St. Louis, Missouri, and found myself in Vermont for my first job. And uh, um it was, I want to say then one of my, one of the first organizations that I got connected with was um, the Women's Health Center. Um, and uh, I, I joined their board after they'd been active. I mean, I was not part of the starting it or anything like that, but when they had moved um, their, their office to North Avenue, right across from the Catholic diocese. And so I was um, involved with the organization then and when um, they're providing uh, reproductive health care and abortions was a huge deal, very controversial and picketing all the time. Um, and so I want to say on some level that is where uh, the beginning where it began for me and uh, realizing that this was something hard for and something that was um, important to make sure that we continue to have it. Absolutely. To that freedom. You must have known Janet Young. I mean, I, the Women's Health Center, boy, what an incredible group of women. I, I didn't know that, that you were associated with that. So I'm so glad you <laughs> shared that with me. Um, so who would you say had the greatest influence on the direction of your life? Hmm. Wow. Um, it's actually, I'm going to say on some level, three women. Um, one of whom, I'm sorry to say, I don't remember her name, but it was the uh, career counselor or whatever who was at Union College when as a senior, I'm going, I have no idea what I want to do and um, et cetera. And I had been a psychology major and she was a social worker. And she said, you know, and I had done some stuff volunteering and we talked about what I was interested in. And she's the one who um, suggested that getting an MSW going to social work school um, would probably be a good fit for me. And um, it was, and um, I want to say, you, even when I would speak politically in introducing myself, I always introduced myself as a social worker because that is what has underpinned my um, policy and my political career. That's that the, that our code of ethics which is, you know, and, and the, the importance of um, the importance of, of ensuring that everyone has an opportunity and can and can succeed and the realization that everyone's story is very different and we need to we need to listen. And all of those um, the sort of, you know, social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, all of that is part and parcel of my education. Um, and then I moved to Vermont. <laughs> so that was so anyway, she was the first. Um, and I want to say the second one, and I do not have as close a relationship with her as I might like, but the second woman on some level was Madeline Cunin. Because when I first, I first, when I first ran for office, I, um, I was not involved in, in politics at all. I was involved in advocacy. I was involved. I was seeing that change, change to make Vermont a better place for the people I was working with to, um, and I thought that the voices of some of the people who were living in poverty, who were struggling with um, 
with issues across the board that um, it wasn't, we needed to change laws. And I saw, but I wasn't involved in, in politics at all, but I saw that Madeline Kunin was, I mean, a woman was running and um, I had had the opportunity to testify as a social worker in front of a committee that was surrounded by what I thought at the time was old men. Um, I'm not sure they really were, but you know, I was relatively young and uh, they weren't really paying attention to what I was saying. And I said, if they can do it, I can do it. Um, and um, so, and the first, so the first time I ran, I lost. Um, it was an open seat in South Burlington. And so that is, so on some level, Madeline Kunin and the, the, what she presented and the fact that she put herself out there. Um, uh, but in terms of my, um, my political career and, and sort of beginning, it's Jean Kennedy who had um, been a legislator and she had been the legislator for South Burlington. I didn't know her, didn't know her for a clue. She was not running again. We come to uh, the summer and I see that the only person who was running for what, what was now an open seat was a Republican. And the seat had been held by a Democrat. And I said, naively, I wanna do this. So I, you know, you know, the, um, the sheep been held by a um, Democrat. We shouldn't lose it. Um, and I had no idea who John Kennedy was. I really was not involved in South Burlington. I'd lived there for a long time, but anyway. So I called up John Kennedy, who had no idea who I was, and she held my hand. She mentored me. She um, told me and 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 provided guidance on not only how to campaign, but how to be a good legislator and um, how, just because I was at the time relatively young and naive and thinking I knew everything that I needed to be involved in the community. And so she provided all of those um, sort of direction and, um, she she she's amazing. I served on the Lund board with her, and I just saw the yeah yeah, yeah. No. amazing. Um, yeah. So those are the three women. That's that's such a great story, really, Anne. Um, so let's talk about some of the bills that you have sponsored, of which there were hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. over your thirty year career in the state house. Um, you, but I want to talk about a few of them. Uh, you okay. sponsored an act to prohibit the involuntary sterilization of individuals with an intellectual disability. And this particularly resonated with me as I have a grandson with autism. Talk a little bit about that, would you? Well, I mean, I wanna say that's one of these <clears throat> policy things that right now I think we would think are amazing and who would ever think about it? And um, I think was, I, I think there's a political party that might think about it. You know, okay, yeah. you're right. Yeah, um, but, but to me, it was absolutely um, unconscionable. Right. And um, and for, um, Vermont had closed the Branson Draining School. We weren't particular. We weren't doing. Um, we weren't doing it. But it was on the books, and it was like, okay, this is something that um, there's no evidence that it's it, that it's necessary. Um, there's no evidence that um, people with intellectual disabilities cannot have full lives. Um, and so, and people have choices and people's autonomy needs to be respected. And um, so this was a place, yeah. yeah. I mean, th thank you, thank you for that. I know that it's, it's not in practice, but it was something on the books. There's a lot of really weird stuff that's on the books and thank you for getting that one off the books. Now, you also sponsored an act relating to possession of firearms by persons subject to final relief from abuse order, which just to me makes so much sense. If somebody's abusing somebody, they probably shouldn't have a firearm. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, um, I, I want to say, you know, I was not the pro I was not the lead sponsor. Others in the legislature have taken um, much greater roles 
and ensuring that that legislation passes as Maxine Grad um, uh, as uh, you know as one. Um, I want to say it's common sense. I mean, I mean, it is. We need to protect and and put um, putting those limitations, putting those guardrails. To me, was common sense and um, needed you, needed to happen. Are you surprised that our that our that our Republican Congress doesn't support that? Um, I am disappointed. Yeah, okay. I am really, I am really disappointed. Um, it's really, and, it's really a war on women. I mean, I'm sorry, but all these positions that they have, it's just one thing after another. Um, um, it, it is. And I, you know, to perhaps I, I should stop talking and let you ask questions. Oh, no, no. But when we think about, um, when we think about, um, the, um, Roe v. Wade and how the Dobbs decision, you know, and all of that. And, uh, as someone said to me recently, um, well, Anne, this election is not just about abortion. I go, you're right. This, this election is about democracy, the future of our country and our way of life. But more equally importantly, it is about Keep, it, it is about ensuring that women and all, you know, women in particular, people in, who are in, in minorities get to live and be and have the freedom to, to live, act, interact with, have the families that they want. And um, that is what we are seeing now is it wasn't just um, to to limit the freedom of, of people making their own healthcare decisions. Um, but it was to uh, bring it back to what some people call the good old days, which is when women had no rights or at no decision-making when um, minorities did not. I mean, it was not the good old days. Truly. So also there was an act that you were involved in. I don't know if you sponsored I thought you had, but an act creating a public school bill in the public schools of rights for transgender and gender nonconforming students. It was so brave. Um, um, thank you. Um, to me, I want to say again, it is, um, it was, it, it, for me personally, it is a, it is a not a, a no brainer. People, you know, students need um, full people who are transgender. It's it's new to many of us. It is a concept that, for many people, is new and they don't understand. That doesn't mean that those individuals do not need protection, do not need the same freedom and rights to live without fear and to be in school and be able to use the bathroom they want that is consistent with how they identify and things like that. Well, thank you for that. Um, you also, and the reason why I'm going through this because I want my viewers to understand the, impact, the incredible impact that you um, and, your fellow, and your fellow representatives had in the state house, but particularly you for your 30 years of service. You also sponsored the, um, the bill to raise the Vermont minimum wage to $15. Um, and, and as we have put in legislation like that on a regular basis, and some might say at this point, $15 doesn't make it. Uh, uh, however, when you think of what the minimum wage is, that, that, that is the floor. And um, people need to be able to, to have a roof over their head, to feed themselves, to go to the doctor when they need to, um, all those things like that. And um, well, thank you for that. I mean, the I think the national minimum wage is what seven fifty or something. I well, mean, right. And then I mean, and then when you think about um, people in the service industry, waiters and waitresses, and their their minimum wage is even lower. Um, and uh, 
Well, also, you, you led the joint resolution condemning the storming of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th as an attack on democracy. You led that joint resolution. And I want to thank you for that. I think Vermont was oh. one of the first states to do that. And, and you've also been a champion of death with dignity. Um, I personally think that that should be, you know, that you should be allowed to do to do more than what you're allowed to do. Uh, but boy, that that was a tough one to get through, and you were a champion of that. Well, thank you. And I I, I have to say, with with that, that took oh, probably ten years. That was like a ten year, um, a ten year piece in the legislature. And I have to I want to. Um, I want to highlight the members of human services. One of the things that as a chair, I was very fortunate and very lucky to have is I um, had wonderful committee members and who were bright and, and, and um, engaged and who were leaders in their own right. And some of us stayed together for quite a long time. And, the folks who worked on death with dignity, um, who started for you know like four years ago, like like um, Sandy Haas and Bill Lippert and um, um, Mike Fisher uh, um, and um, Bill Frank, um, those those individuals um, worked summers to figure things out, and then at the same time, what our committee did was. Um, look at the look at the larger issue of how people the, of the choices people make as they are um, near the end of their life. So we wrote things around palliative care to ensure that um, whether they were the, the people got the care that they wanted and needed to keep them comfortable. And so we worked on that. We worked on um, decision making in terms of um, advanced directives, all in preparation for, or all also in concert with Death with Dignity. Um, but that was, I want to say, that was a committee. That was, um, I was blessed with having an incredible committee who took the lead. Um, we were, we worked well. And I hung out with uh, the Waterses, um, you know, Dick. Yeah and uh, Ginny Waters, and also Madeline, yes. Kitchen, leader in that. And we spent a lot of time yes. down at that state house. Um, yes, getting, did. Getting, getting yelled at and you know, ostracized. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Um, so to my viewers, I mean, this is just a snapshot of the impact that you made during your 30 years in the state house. But the issue that I believe you hold dear, dear to your heart is your work enshrining reproductive liberty into Vermont's constitution. Yeah. Um, that... Um, that is what that is probably on the highlight um, of my career. It is why I stayed the last two years in the legislature. Um, in my head and uh, um, in my, if I have any control over my life, I was like, okay, I'm not going to run again. It is time for um, the next generation. Um, I was beginning to see. Uh, issues that I had worked on that were cutting edge when we passed them were no longer cutting edge and they needed to be changed, you know, or updated. And I'm like, okay, um, now it's time for someone else to come in and do that. But uh, the, my last two years I ran and I, I ran because I wanted to see, as you well know, um, enshrining it in the constitution is at minimum a four year process to legislative, um, <clears throat> two different legislative bienniums. And so that's what I wanted to do. Um, and people like you, people um, who have been working on this for eons and who um, provided all of the, the energy and the support while we were doing this was incredible. And um, as you well know, um, when it passed, it passed when when the, when people voted for it, when we brought it to the voters, every single solitary town it passed. It passed in every single solitary town. So while um, it is not something to rest on our laurels and Vermonters, it, it um 
is not necessarily so different from other places. <clears throat> this is a place where um, the fact that we can be very proud. I think that that the majority in every single solitary town believe in women's autonomy, women, um, individuals' freedom to make their own reproductive decisions. And and they say that 70% of our country believes that. And I, and I do <laughs> believe the Reproductive Liberty Amendment passed in Vermont by almost 70%. So yeah. we're, you yeah. know, the country feels this way too. <laughs> I believe that I first got to know you sitting at the head of a committee table. You were sitting at the head of the committee table when I testified in support yep. of Bill 57, uh, yep. which would protect, this is before the reproductive liberty, which would protect yep. reproductive rights and abortion here in Vermont. You've spent half of your life, almost half of it, sitting at the head of committee tables, ushering in progressive and valuable, important bills through the state house. Are, are you missing this work? Um. I would be lying if I said I didn't miss being at the table, if I didn't miss sometimes being at the um, head of the table. Um, at the same time, uh, I am enjoying getting to know the rest of Vermont, <laughs> um, the rest of what Vermont has to offer and being able to go out and take a walk whenever I want to or things like that. Um, and I, I think what I'm, um, I, I'm learning that when you're not there to rely solely on um, the news or other, or other things, you don't get the full picture of what, get, what gets done. And um, so part of the, I, I wanna say part of what I find myself doing because people will ask me is talking is talking about it talking about how you how we have to talk with each other and how we have to respect each other whether we agree um, and uh, you know as a perhaps elder statesman you know am I pleased when someone gives me a call and they they um, want some advice or they want to run something by me um, so I you know but really what I want to do now uh, is is teach or um, show people how to be involved and the importance of of connecting with their local legislators because in Vermont we can make things happen and we can and we have made things better for Vermonters so that they can live life to the fullest that they can and. Um, have the uh, most choices that they can. Beautifully said. So, Anne, where do you see the future of our country in the next 10 years? Uh, um, I don't know. Um, I'm scared. Um, I am hopeful. I am hopeful, but what I am, uh, I think this is a pivotal election that we are um that, that we that we have before us, and uh, it. To, um, maybe because I'm living it right now, it to me feels like one of the most um, important presidential elections um, that I've ever um, voted in, and I voted in all of them since I was able to vote um, because. We need to um, we need to right our ship. <laughs> we need to to sort of shift the 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 course that um, the winds that are that are strong um, from the far right for people from individuals who want to um, take us back to a time that was not um, successful for people who want to take away rights who um, want to. Um, bring our economy down to um, really um, the bottom and who, and so I think for me, the election and who, um, and, and who, who is elected will in fact um, chart the course in the next um, 10 years. 
I am excited about seeing uh, younger people be involved. There was, a, I mean, you know, and there was a time in the legislature um, when who would come testify um, made me seem young. Um, and uh, but to see the energy of the next generation and the generation even, you know, earlier than that, to be excited and to be energized and to want to work um, to make things different and to get their hands dirty. And that excites me. And it excites me when people realize that change doesn't happen overnight. Um, it, I wish it did, but it doesn't. Um, and uh, I think I have the right, I, all the right answers. And you probably think you have all the right answers, but what we know is that we don't, and that I may have a very strong opinion. Someone else may have an equally strong opinion. I need to listen to what that is. Um, and I, you know, whether, whether it is um, the reproductive freedom and enshrining that into the constitution, whether it was um, what was then known as death with dignity, um, whether it was um, um, allowing methadone to be prescribed in the state of Vermont because it was not, um, I mean, be able to be used um, for treating opioid addiction um, in an outpatient setting. To enact those laws to, took years. It did not just take two years. It, it took education. It took um, understanding. And it took sometimes three steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, two steps, I mean, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm both worried and excited. So I am hopeful um, as to, to what, but I just, I want everyone, you need to vote. And I'm gonna be really clear, you need to vote Democratic. You're here. So um, Anne, what words of wisdom would you give to young people today who are dealing with the issues of saving our democracy, climate change, income inequality, college debt, pandemics, and uh, their own personal freedoms. Oh God, I, please keep your passion. Please um, talk to people, um, vote, get to know your, get to know your local people. And because knowing them and share your knowledge. Um, I do want to say the teacher in me says, learn about what you are so passionate about. Um, go beyond the rallies. Go beyond, um, because regrettably, the solutions are not simple. Um, and whether it's a word here or there, or whether it is, um, we can get halfway there. And right now that's as far as we can go. And it's, it's not the best. It's a step in the right direction. And let's keep that forward movement. So some of those things, I mean, to listen, you know, to be involved and talk and um, and don't give up hope and see what in fact has happened. Um, but also to, um, to listen and read. You're here. Well, Ann Pugh, I gotta tell you, I am um, blown away by you on so many levels and um, oh. I, hope, I hope I can get you back on my show later on um, oh. you know, when things hopefully straighten out a little bit. Yeah. Um, but thank you for your well, thank you. half a half a lifetime of service to the state of Vermont, to you know, my viewers. I mean, you look out there to a lot of the great things that have happened in the last 30 years to bring Vermont up to the up to up to where it is as a as a progressive and kind and loving state who cares about uh humanity. Um, Ann Pugh is one of the people that we can thank for that. So Ann, thank you for your service. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you for being my friend. And I look forward to us getting together again for lunch soon. And oh. until we see you again, 
Uh, to my viewers, thank you for always joining me for my show. And I wish you a good day and a happy week. Do take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.